associate professor at School of Electrical Engineering at Alta University. He is the head of the intelligence, uh, Intelligent Robotics Research Group, and his research interests uh, lie mainly in intelligent robotic systems and robotic vision. Right? Uh, Billy, before joining Alta, Billy was a professor in computer science in Lachlan University of Technology, uh, and he also obtained his PhD degree from Lachlan Rand University. Thanks. Okay. Thanks for the introduction. So, <coughs> uh, sorry if I'm a couple of minutes late, but I'm trying to catch up. Um, let's start. So, uh, already I think I was introduced. So, today uh, I will talk about simulation based learning for robots. I gave a presentation to Spain in the series a year ago or so about uh, that was concentrating on HRI aspects and how we, uh, we are doing also learning in, in interaction. But this time I'm talking about simulation. Again, I want to just to clarify, this is not the only machine learning uh, viewpoint we are looking at in my group, but that's anyway to keep this talk somehow consistent. I didn't want to talk, uh, talk about too many things at the same time. But I will anyway start with general robotics. Oh, the top doesn't show too well. Better we can break some kind of change. The Maybe take the screen. Raise the screen a bit. Uh, yeah. Let's try it. just by talking. So, imitating human is an option uh, uh, to teach robots these kind of skills. But on the other hand, today I'll talk about a slightly different thing, because when we do imitation, the problem is that if you have different situations, gathering the data for all of those possible different situations from human demonstrations is not really viable. So we have to, in addition to possibly do some human demonstrations, have other ways to extend at least that knowledge, which is by having the robot uh, practice by itself, so by reinforcement learning. So today we will talk about, in the context of reinforcement learning, which the framework is possibly familiar to most of you, but just a quick recap, so there's an agent that works in a world uh, the agent chooses actions, uh, it observes the state of the world after each action, and it observes some kind of reward function which it tries to maximize. So it tries to, its uh, goal is to maximize the sum, in a simple example, just the sum or the type of all these rewards. Uh, and the action rule it uses is a policy which just maps the observed state, the current state, to the action it will choose. So the problem is to somehow figure out the pie, the policy here, such that this sum of rewards over possibly infinite type horizon or sometimes finite time horizon is maximized. In most cases, it is assumed that the, the world is my polyam in state and action. That means that if we can just observe the current state and the current action, we then uh, the uh, the distribution over the next state is perfectly defined. So knowing about previous states or previous timings then doesn't really matter. So we'll look at that a bit later uh, when that doesn't hold. But in simple cases, this uh, Markovian uh, assumption is uh, 
quite good. And that's uh, the assumption that's made in all uh, traditional reinforcement learning. So basically, we just have a function which is a sum of some uh, uh, f uh, reward functions that we want to maximize. So what is difficult? Difficulty comes from the point of view that this is really a time series. So the rewards might be delayed. We don't, it's not sufficient that we just maximize the reward for the next action, because we want to maximize the long-term reward. So uh, if the reward really comes from the longer term, and if initially we don't have any clue about the reward function and about the state transition function, the dynamics of the state. This is really difficult because we are in the first uh, uh, um, instant, we are trying to start to learn to play a game that we don't know rules of. The only thing is when we execute actions, we can observe what they do. And when we win the game or lose the game, we observe the end state. Or we observe the reward at that end state. Of course, in many cases, we can get rewards also during this whole sequence of actions, such as there might be costs for your actions. But if your task is to, let's say, for the robot to get me coffee, which is my favorite task, uh, is that still, if I reward the robot only after it's given the coffee to me, it has to figure out a pretty long sequence of actions and do all those correctly successful before you will get any reward from me, before you will get the facts. So that means that starting without any of this uh, idea of these models, of these intermediate models, is extremely difficult in terms of it needs a huge amount of exploration. Because the robot basically has to try about all, not only good things, but also all bad things all different actions in different situations in order to figure out how the world works and what are the desired states. So, uh, reinforcement learning can be, uh, uh, is done based on exploration and for that reason it's really quite an enormous amount of try. So here's an example from last year from OpenAI for learning uh, dexterous manipulation. That's basically how to learn to rotate the cube in your hand. The amount of experience for the robot to learn that was 100 years. So I guess that most humans would learn things such as manipulation with less experience than 100 years, otherwise we could, wouldn't be able to do that. But at the moment, the kind of state of art dexterous manipulation requires 100 years of experience. Of course, when we do collect that from a physical system, it's really costly. Because physical the systems need time. 100 years is a long time. And data collection also poses wear and tear in the robot. That's not everything. There's also the problem that if you just explore doing random stuff, then maybe are safe. We don't want the robot to hit itself, break itself. We don't want the robot to break people, the environment. And when we are working with systems that are physical, they definitely can do that. The exploration is uh, really difficult to do also for that reason. So in, play, uh, in practice we can only explore in a very narrow bound sorry, uh, around some set of states which we already know that are state. We can only do small modifications around that state, uh, path of states in order to uh, ensure that we are within some safe uh, radio state. So basically, what, uh, how reinforcement learning robotics is done, it requires typical simulation. Nice thing is that we know pretty much about physics. Robotics is primarily about mechanical engineering and understanding mechanics of uh, rigid bodies or soft bodies, but really understanding the mechanics of the world. And we know that pretty, pretty well. So we can simulate it with reasonable access. Uh, so that means that instead of the robot training in the physical world, the robot will have the simulator. We have that imaginary robot, and it will train 
itself in the simulated world before trying to act in the physical world. Right? So that causes one challenge. So we really need to have now, instead of what the earlier said, we don't make any assumption of what the world is. Now we do need to make assumptions what the world is. In that, and all those assumptions are now encapsulated in that simulation model we built about the robot and its environment. So of course the robot can learn about the world that's not captured in a simulation model because that's the world, that's the imaginary world, the simulated virtual world where the robot learns. And that probably shows you already some of the problems that we then get. So, uh, so when basically we look at this setting, we, it's not trivial to do this either, because we have a few different things. First of all, is it really that easy to build that simulation? Uh, that varies. Uh, well, the good thing is that simulations are engines. So once you have built, uh, they are frameworks. So you can build a good framework and then apply that in multiple cases such that you don't necessarily need to start from scratch at all parts of the simulation. On the other hand, the simulation might not be always that uh, cheap in the sense that it will still require a significant amount of at least computational time. In the worst case, it might require more computational time than running the experiment in real world. Of course, it, that will still address the safety issue because you can or if you break stuff in simulation, you don't really have to uh, worry about it. And finally, how realistic is the simulation? So, I next talk about, I'll kind of get into machine learning part of this and a bit more details. I'll talk about these basically two things. First of all, the cost of simulation. So that even though we use simulation, I'm not talking about making simulators faster, but I'm talking about Increasing sample efficiency. So maximizing the sample efficiency of the learning, even though we, um, we hopefully can simulate 100 years of experience in a few weeks, uh, with, I guess, that was around 6,000 cores and uh, I don't know how many uh, GPU cores, but, but really with a, with a massively parallelized system. As I was used in the OpenAI example. So, uh, the other problem is the realism of the simulation, the mismatch between the visual world and the physical world. And both have to be addressed somehow. These are probably the uh, two most important things uh, that have to be addressed in this kind of learning. So, let's start with the, uh, a couple of different approaches. I'm not playing, I'm doing a kind of overview of the, all of those, so I'm just giving a uh, a few peaks uh, at that, in particular, a few peaks that we have been uh, we have found very useful and also quite general. Uh, but I know that these are not the all the avenues of research that have currently been pursued uh, around the world. So let's start by the first uh, first of all something uh, that typical. Most of the, especially the deep reinforcement learning that's all the hype at the moment, uh, is trying to uh, basically optimize the problem directly. So trying to directly look at the gradient of the reward function. The reward is the sum of all rewards, or the return is the sum of all rewards over time. And numerically just look at that and do uh, either a gradient based optimization or another, uh, maybe some uh, metaheuristic like CMAES type of optimizer uh, to try to directly optimize that, uh, that re uh, reward function. But that has a problem that it's still extremely time consuming. Uh, that the 100 years of experience is an example of that. And that, uh, uh, that Typically, the number of samples to learn relatively simple skills is in the order of hundreds of millions. And there are a couple of different reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that 
because you are optimizing the policy, you can't learn, uh, you can't use too much information from your uh, history. Because you are kind of, you know, it's an, uh, the methods are online uh, in sense that that they you look only at uh, the policy around the current point and try to do local optimization to make the policy better. So you can't really use much history because that earlier part might have touched or gone to another place in your state space, which is you are not uh, at the moment using, you might at some later point when the optimization progress is used, but you're kind of discarding all the different. So that leads to another set of reinforcement learning approaches, which are called, uh, which is called model-based RL, and are not necessarily as well known as uh, small free ones. Uh, and the idea is that, in addition to just doing uh, the policy update, what we are doing, we are really learning as well the dynamics model. So we are learning parallel to learning what to do. We are learning how the world works. So the idea is that we basically run the current policy, the decision uh, function we have, to collect some data about what happened when in state t, I uh, executed action t, there's t plus one is the next state. So I learned what happened there. That gives me just a data set. And I can think that some, using some regression function, either I could do uh, just a, well, whatever regression method you have, Use the gene, use what not, whatever is your own fancy regression method that you want to use. Now the idea is that because this is a regression method, it can also interpolate, at least hopefully, decently. That means that you can optimize the policy, not only taking into account of what was your, uh, what was your reward at this point, but you can basically optimize the policy also using uh, in other states, which you can basically interpolate uh, from that dynamics model. And the reason why this is model-based uh, reinforcement learning is uh, quite useful in robotics is because our action spaces and state spaces are usually continuous. Your, our joint angles are continuous for the robot. Our position in the world is continuous variable. Uh, our actions for example, joint talks in each different joint are also continuous. That means that interpolation is very kind of natural uh, and often works uh, quite well compared to uh, environments which where, where the state or uh, action spaces are discrete. Interpolation in discrete state spaces might not be made as much sense at all. So once we have just determined policy, we can execute, for example, or, or optimize the change of policy uh, based on the new information we know about how the world works. We can just do a single or a few actions, collect more data about how the world works in that case, and repeat. So what we are doing is, in addition to just building the model about the uh, the uh, the basically local optimizer, you can see a bit dissimilar to the actor critic methods where instead of learning dynamics model, you are learning the value function. So you're trying to uh, learn to predict the value of different states. But in this case, we don't really try to learn the value function. We typically are learning the immediate rewards in different states, and we are learning the dynamics of the world. But we learn what happens when we do different things. So this improves typically the sample efficiency from, let's say, hundreds of millions to, in best case, to hundreds. So in any case, typically these methods are, when they work, uh, they are orders of magnitude faster than the uh, policy search methods that don't make this assumption. There are, of course, downsides to this method. First of all, for this to work, what you are assuming, first of all, that the underlying dynamics really are Markovian, so that they can be represented by that. If your state space doesn't capture everything you need to, uh, to basically make the prediction, 
the, uh, the policy, you're basically, you're misassumption, but you're wrong. And that means that the model-based methods wouldn't be able to maximize the rewards as well as methods that would not use that assumption. So one, one ba basic assumption that even though here I've written this in a deterministic form, this could be equally just uh, estimating the distribution between SD plus 1, SD and AT. So, so it could be a uh, probabilistic regression instead of, of a really deterministic regression. But in that case, the assumption that we make here is Markovianity. Uh, and if that assumption is, is broken, then these methods will probably go to quite suboptimal uh, uh, or find quite, quite suboptimal solutions. So that's about that. Uh, let's look at another way to do it. So again, another thing is that physical simulation of complex mechanical systems can still be decently costly. Uh, for example, if we are uh, uh, trying to simulate deformable bodies, such as here's a piece of cloth that the robot is holding, uh, uh, the uh, type of methods are, uh, that I use are often finite element methods. And they are decently heavy computationally. And the same goes for things like fluid dynamics, where you use FMEs, uh, FEMs as well. And the problem is that if you use these heavy computational simulations, even though they might be, let's say, uh, they are safer than doing it in the real world, and they might be even slightly faster, well, sometimes even slower, but we can't do even hundreds of thousands of iterations in those kind of methods, which is our kind of, when we are talking about thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands, that's still typically the number of iterations, even when we have model-based reinforcement learning running that we need. Uh, so what we can do is to use regression methods as summaries. Because this is a bit similar idea to using the model, uh, uh, model-free reinforcement learning altogether. But now the idea is that if you can do a number of simulations Maybe we don't need to simulate all the states fully. When we are in a low uncertainty prediction from our model, from, the, from a regression model, we can just use the regression model instead. So that by incrementally gathering data from the regression model, uh, uh, oh sorry, uh, from, from the simulation, and when we, the, uh, our regression model, the predicted uh, uh, let's say the prediction uncertainty of the regression model is low, we will just use the regression model. We will trust that the interpolation works. That means that we have to have models like GPs, Gaussian processes, that are able to capture the predictive uncertainty of the model as well. So we have, if we have those kind of models, we can only use the simulation for cases where we don't know or when the predicted uncertainty of this regression model is slow. That means that we can just use the supervised learning to train this surrogate model. And, uh, and then one more thing that we can use is to even use the model uncertainty directly. So that if we have, a, let's say, a GP here as the uh, state transition model, what we can do is we can also use that uncertainty in propagating and predicting rewards as well. That means that for cases where we are less certain, we will, through the simulation, we will, pre, uh, we will try to propagate not only a single state, but the distribution of states. Sometimes that can be done because some simulations are differentiable. And if they're differentiable, that means that we can typically do a first order approximation and propagate the uncertainties in a closed form. Sometimes that uncertain propagation requires doing samples. So, the other pro uh, problem that we have is the sparsity of learning problem. So, delay rewards make it really hard to get started. Any learning problem. 
And that typically means that tip, uh, when you do, a, let's say, deep reinforcement learning method, uh, especially in deep reinforcement learning, you get this all effects amplified, is that the variance of how long time for the method to learn something, uh, learn to complete the task, varies huge. So sometimes you get lucky, because sometimes your random number generator gets lucky. And you do the correct things in the first, or, or soon, only after a million iteration, you happen to come up with the correct action sequence to complete your task. On other times, you are not lucky and you require 100 million iterations before you get even a decent uh, sequence of action, such that you start to have some information. So the idea is that really, in many cases, the gradient of the reward function that we are optimizing around the initial policy, that, uh, around the first trial we do, is around zero. That means the gradient doesn't give us almost any information what we should do. When you have a gradient that's really uninformative, you're really just throwing dice and hoping for the best, or doing uh, darts blindly and not knowing in which direction is the dart. So that means that good initialization is very valuable. Unfortunately, that has led at the uh, recent, uh, recently at, uh, at cases where people are uh, reporting, for, especially for paper writing. I'm not criticizing the methods, but I'm criticizing a bit about the, how people are approaching research. Is reporting, for example, their best results or the average of best three. Well, actually, the huge variance comes from oh, we run it for a week and nothing happened. It never got from the away from the starting state. That also happens. So that's really difficult, a big difficulty. One of you was a new um, uh, last uh, year. There was a, one of the plenaries that really targeted this. That how should we look at the problem and how people do research, especially with learning methods, how often they really converge, and how, how large is the variance of result. I see the same thing here. But what you can do is, in many cases, Use this human demonstration as a starting point. So, for example, if a human demonstrates, oh, this is a, the, the, okay, I uh, yes, we'll recognize the problem. This is a so called boiling cup task where, uh, okay, now I need to get more, less lights, otherwise you won't see any. Now, maybe you see there's a ball on a string that the robot tries to throw into the cup it's holding. So, this is a kind of thing where you need to do first probably motion in one direction, then the other direction. So basically, you need to do a certain trajectory to get the ball in the car. And the idea is that we can do, uh, get a decent starting point, at least get the ball swinging, swinging uh, sufficiently, even if it doesn't hit the car at all, uh, by human demonstration. That means that we're suddenly in an area where the reward function starts to have a decent grade. Some of we are getting closer to area where we start to be able to use really local optimization. And the nice thing about that is that, especially when we talk about learning a set of policies for a wide variety of tasks that are, that are similar, that are parameterized by some complex parameter. For example, here the complex might be Oh, you don't see anything, sorry, I have to write <laughs> lights here. But there's a robots that have different length of that string where the ball is going. So the trajectories need to be decently different when the string length goes from 20 centimeters to 40 or 50. That means that really you have to, it's not only that you have to uh, amplify your motion with the, uh, with, the, with the same scale, you have to really do some other changes. But the good thing is that if you have demonstration for one case that is decent, you can learn to optimize that case. And when you start from that case, you can start to incrementally optimize the other cases. So you can change the context parameter now a little bit and start with the policy that was fine for a neighboring case, so to say. 
which means that you're able to incrementally learn a wider and wider and wider set of policies or policies that apply for a wider and wider domain of the context. That means that with a single demonstration, because you were able to find that manifold, at one point in the manifold of successful policies, you are able to now start to do search within that manifold and not in that high dimensional 60 or 100 or 1000 dimensional policy space. Because you are already in the manifold of policies, well, you have to only change in the manifold depending on the context. Um, a few words about realism of simulation and how we can address that part. So, so far we only look at the problem of costly simulation. So, reasons for reality cap are, I'd say, there are three different reasons. First of all, which is not necessarily that interesting, is sensing uncertainty. We kind of can see all the things, but we can't see them precisely enough. For example, a robot sees, hears an object, but it, the camera resolution is uh, limited, so it doesn't see exactly the pose of the object correctly, but it gets a pretty good approximation. In most cases, we can kind of include that uncertainty also in the sensor model. So if we simulate that uncertainty as well, we can get policies that are robust against that uncertainty. So that's not a major problem in most cases. The two other things that are bigger, the first thing is calibration mismatch. So simulation parameters might be wrong, or that we just don't know them. For example, the friction coefficient of an object, or uh, between the, the robot and, uh, and the, or the object and the environment, or between the robot and the objects, are unknown. And that will affect quite heavily how their interaction will look. So that's one part. But the worst part is also or there's a reverse thing which is unmodeled pattern. So for example, we are modeling now manipulation uh, uh, in, in, let's say, um, in uh, earth wall manipulation, and we try to apply that underwater. Where we suddenly have things such as viscous friction, or basically the, the water trying to prevent motion. If you learn to, uh, to walk, Above ground, try doing that underwater. It won't work. Your policy won't work. If you just try to walk underwater, the same thing you do above ground, it won't work. So there is something missing in the simulation, some physical phenomena typically, that we that's not in, uh, that, that exists in the real world. So Let's look, but I will try to talk about the calibration mismatch because that's where we did most of the work. So one way to address that is domain priorization. Most people have probably, or people that have done any vision have heard or read the recent papers on, um, on deep learning in vision have heard about domain randomization. The idea is that you randomize stuff in your simulations or your model generation that you don't want to care about. For example, vision, that means that you randomize the textures of the objects. So if you want to find all possible cups in the world, you randomize the texture in your cup models such that the only thing that the convolutional neural network in that case would pay attention to would be the shape of the object, to say it's a cup. So basically you build in invariances to some particular change in, in the environment by training the system to be robust or to ignore those changes. <coughs> if you can just train those, that, that, that's fine. So we can do the same thing here, for example, for friction. We can try to build a model where we basically just, uh, if we know the model, we can build models for each different friction. We can build policies that now depend on that friction. We can we will get a set of policies for the dependent friction. But we can also do domain randomization, so we can build a model that, uh, that maximizes the expectation uh, over some prior of that friction. So if you have any idea of how small, how large a friction can be, look at your physics textbook and look at the lowest friction coefficient dimensions and the highest 
it mentions going from something like uh, Teflon to um, to uh, uh, steel on steel, which is pretty hardy. Uh, you will get a range from 0.04 maybe to let's say two, and then you know that it's pretty unlikely that you, the friction will be outside that range. So you have a prior for the friction. So now we can try to not change uh, or, or maximize the reward not only over a single model, but over that set of models. That, of course, means that we have to simulate trials with a set of parameter values. In practice, we have to choose it or do it with a discrete set of parameter values. Which, uh, which captures the distribution. So we have to do basically an MC approximation for this expectation. Okay? But that's something that, we, uh, that has been quite successful in our experience for cases where it works. So here's, for example, one example. Just wanted to show you one video where real robots work. Uh, There's a uh, reason where, where the idea is to basically follow the flow as accurately as possible uh, the, uh, such that, I mean, the blue one is our method where the error should be close to zero. These are two earlier methods that have clear bias on one way or the other. The idea is that the, the clothes are different. So they actually are, the bends in the clothes are pretty different from each other. Uh, and. Uh, and they depend quite a lot on the uh, they depend on the properties that we don't necessarily know. So the idea is to now maximize, uh, optimize the policy over different properties, such that we will be able to hopefully find a policy that works independent of that, uh, that property. So that we have a policy. Actually, we the last one we saw that uh, the last example where the error is a bit larger. Our prior was wrong. So we expected the material properties to be within some range, and for the last piece of cloth, the properties were out of that range. And that's exactly then we see, I think for this one, we see that effect here. Or was it the chiffon? I'm, I'm not under what sure. But you see that then this, your priors have a large effect on what, whatever you have. So finally, uh, I want to do, uh, say a, a couple more words. This is the final technical content about the dark domain randomization. It's not a solution to all your problems. So, for example, do I have a pen here? Here's a box. Here's my hand pushing it. Where will that move? I'm trying to hit the center line of the box. That's my Where will that move? Suddenly. It depends. Exactly. <coughs> so it depends on the location of the center of friction of that box. There, it, it might be here, in which case the box moves forward. Right? But the, uh, the center of friction is along that line. But if the center of friction, if there's a, something inside the box at this end, something heavy, which makes the center of friction here, the box will start basically rotating that way. Or if there's something here inside the box, the box will start rotating that way. So there are things that there is no way any policy, because we get this kind of bifurcation like behavior in the dynamics, that a single policy would be able to call for those two kind of opposite family. Right? Because it can rotate that way or that way. The, on average, it will not rotate at all. But you can then build a policy that comes with those two cases with a token. So the problem is that we have to have a time series of the system in order to determine or uh, to observe what happens. It means that we have, uh, because errors accumulate quite heavy over time, so we do even small error at one step, we have to continue the, doing the action over a long time, we'll just get somewhere in a really wrong place in the policy space. And organization is not sufficient. 
But in this case, often for physical systems, relatively short history can be. So if we knew what we did previously, and we knew what happened at that time, that can be sufficient, and it often is, for uh, finding a policy that works. The reason is that these systems, the physical systems, are still low order differential equations. And because of that structure, that means that if you have, for example, first order differential equation, the differential equation is basically observable from two points of, uh, of time. If you can order, uh, if you can measure, and you can basically you assume that's linear locally, you can observe the differential equation. You can identify from shock history. That means that the policy, even if you don't build the identification explicitly, the policy can do that implicitly. The policy is able to capture or learn how this history maps to something, some internal representation that captures how the world works. In this particular case, well, it's been trained to identify all particular cases. So that means that we often have short history is sufficient in order for these kind of systems to really capture the things where we when domain organization is insufficient. So I want to now speak this closing down in 10 seconds. So what I'm playing here is that robotics provides an exciting application area for AI and machine learning. It has high data cost and poor data availability, which are of course to some extent uh, not nice uh, for ML researchers. Uh, on the other, uh, other hand, it has long temporal horizon and uh, also often sparse reward structure. Again, making it kind of nasty problem for uh, many uh, machine learning methods which rely on local gradient and local optimization. And like I said earlier, the initial policies of the gradients are zero, meaning that you can't do much in the beginning, you are kind of lost. Uh, simulators can be used, uh, but there are two buts. First of all, they still may be costly, and they might, uh, their realism is limited. So we're trying to use machine learning address both those problems, both the cost of simulation by using the surrogate uh, machine learning models, typically regression models of surrogate, as well as addressing um, the limited realism by, uh, by being able to simulate different conditions to build the robustness against the variability that exists in the real world. So the temporal dimension of those systems has that kind of introduces challenges, basically the combinatorial explosion that you get when you have to make sequence of decisions where your, uh, your end state depends on really that whole sequence. But at the same time, you have interesting new opportunities, especially doing active and incremental learning. So really taking into account, because your actions kind of take what you will learn about the world, for example, in active learning, and incremental learning such that you can build the models incremental. Uh, so that's, I think, where I wanted to uh, close up. I'll just draw around some interesting ML research questions that came to my mind when I was preparing to talk, but I'll leave them there and then if, I mean, we are all tight, but let's have some questions if you, any of you have time. Thanks. Somehow address the 
first of all, the, that the, the models, uh, the biases that are built by the structure in the model, so, so the adversarial, which uh, uh, the idea of adversariality that tries to uh, make the models uh, robust against uh, kind of being, uh, how would I say, too, uh, too simple in some sense. Uh, and I think that uh, to some extent I see uh, similarities here. On the other hand, uh, I'm not sure, because in that case we still expect to get uh, data that us is from the real domain. The problem with simulators is that, especially when we are looking at the unexplored phenomena, we don't have data from the original domain. We have data from another domain, which needs to be somehow transferred uh, to the target domain, that's the physical world. So, so I think there's a, there's a very close uh, relationship to transfer learning uh, in that sense, uh, more than even the adversarial robustness. But I agree that the robustness issue definitely comes up also in the uh, learning the regression model. But feel free to disagree. I say that the, it hasn't been explored a lot, a lot at all. Uh, I just want to remark that the sort of incrementally lengthening the string, for example, yes. was uh, and doing that kind of work yes. uh, has a striking resemblance to how people do sports coaching, which yeah. is kind of yeah. interesting to see. Yeah. I mean, that's a, how to ultimately design curricula for incremental learning. I mean, it's, it's, well, people are talking about curricula or learning curricula in the area of incrementally learning more and more complex policies and yeah, I agree very much. And so, so especially the sort of that you have to learn to do the one thing so that you really understand it, so that it really goes like well, and then you can sort of start to extrapolate that to the next step rather than hopping to the next step one step what you once you sort of are okay with the previous. Which might even have something to do with uh, pedagogy, if you think about it. Thanks for coming. Um, I was wondering with the in the citation. Um, so you mentioned that it's when you have a reward that's really far away, you kind of just get stuck exploring in the starting space. Um, can you use sort of like an so say with the robotic arm, you could use an example of okay. I basically just grab the arm and I like swing the thing around and get some data that way, like maybe 10 tries. And then could you use something like Gaussian processes to uh, work out which bits of the safe space you then need to explore and optimize for after like just those 10 tries? Or does that still like not help you that much in terms of figuring out what bits of the state space, state space to explore? So uh, I can repeat this one. Um, yeah, so can you use like a few sort of actual examples of what behavior you want? Right? Yes. Uh, and then use a GP to figure out which bits of the state space you need to explore after that. Or does that not? Yeah, so, so uh, uh, the point is that, that the state space is huge. You don't want to explore the whole state space. So, I mean, the, the kind of just information greeting <coughs> algorithm doesn't work because that will just push you those areas that are you haven't seen, and because state space is huge, there's always things that you haven't seen. Mm -hmm. So, so in just let's say looking at the most informative, in, let's say where your GP uncertainty reduces mostly, isn't helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely you can do what you said. But of course, what you want to do is you want to look at that states where the reward, but the, where the potential for increasing the reward is maximum. So if you have a GP for the reward, mm. and uh, that means that you can uh, basically look at the answer predictive, maybe some upper confidence bound for the reward in the GP, and try to get to those states. The problem is, if you don't know the dynamics, you don't know how to get to those states, even if you know that's where I would like to be, and that's where the kind of the dynamics model comes to, because you try to use that to, uh, to, to predict which kind of actions would push you towards those states that are have the potential for high reward. 
Even if you haven't seen them, you'll be there. That's really true, or not? Well, what's your feeling today? Of, so like you mentioned earlier that you could sort of build an engine and increment it. So, uh, what, what what does it look like at the moment? Are there like people build like communities building engines and adding more and more stuff so that you could just get a good off-the-shelf engine and train your stuff on, or do people just basically roll their own? Like, what's the, what's your feeling? At the moment? Well, there's uh, there are set of simulation engines, but for example, what we see in autonomous cars is that we get we have seen the development where people do very simple car games still a couple of years ago, and now we have very good autonomous or much better open source autonomous driving simulators. So we have seen that for the particular application there has been a development of high realism uh, simulators that basically everybody is forced to use because they are so much better than everything, anything else. In a general physics simulation that's not yet the case. There are, there are competing methods but getting your work as part of, let's say, or being used by Google and OpenAI, of course, promotes your method because then others want to compare against you. So there are a couple of, uh, there's basically, at least Mujoko is one of the engines that many people are using for the reason that it has been promoted quite heavily by, uh, by a few influential groups using it. But I say that then uh, the engines that are, or the, not everything is open source. For example, in the physics engine world, the best ones are typically not open source uh, or not open available, not even uh, uh, freely available. 